It was like the fourth lowest score or whatever. <laughs> was, Fucking roast you. Of course, I go hero RB and just took all the receivers that busted round like week one, like T. Higgins, Mike Williams. I was looking down the list. I was like, damn. Anyone who's like in the industry went with the exact same team build. They got some quarterbacks mm-hmm. up top. They they grabbed like five or six stud wide receivers and. I have a feeling most of them probably finish that way. But that, listen, like if you're going into a draft with a set strategy, it's something yeah. that play, like the, the problem with being so exposed to the world in terms of like what you talk about all summer is every mm-hmm. single comment that you get right now acts as if your 75 videos you put out over the last three months were aimed towards week one DFS. Like that's the fucking problem. It's like, no, dude, I didn't yeah. draft for one fucking lineup of week one DFS. We're drafting for overall strategy. We're drafting for, you know, Hopefully longevity of the team it never feels good week one when everybody just absolutely fucking bombs. But yeah, that's how I usually set my teams up is not that I don't want to be the top scorer week one. I mean, that would be awesome. But yeah, my teams are set up for longevity. Like I feel like I made like the like the cocky industry analyst move because I have DeAndre Hopkins on my team. So I was like, oh, we're going against a mix of like people that are taking this super seriously and some people that want to have fun. Fuck it. Let's yeah. take DeAndre Hopkins. That just seemed like the perfect move where you think you're better at drafting than everyone else. I'm probably going to regret doing that. Yeah. Like those know. are the kind of moves that I'll usually make where I'm like, you know what? Let's just bet on myself the first six weeks. And if for some reason I'm three and three or better, like boom, this team looks awesome now. Yeah. I was curious to see how like drafts played out for people like yourself. So we we had given away, uh, you know, a handful, like 30 to 40 of the, uh, the BG3 passes to come play mm-hmm. in the bash with us for free. Everybody else, the remaining 560, you know, 60 people all paid to get into it so i figured like if i'm in your guys' spot right and i'm like okay this is a 600 person league i kind of want to win the whole thing i'm just kind of i'm gonna send it right and i'm not really gonna Mm -hmm. i'm I'm gonna try different strategies and i'm gonna try things that i might not normally try because i don't really have a lot at risk which is absolutely the case so i mean it makes sense to go with a guy like d hop it makes sense to just like kind of fuck around and be like this is something that i don't know if i have the balls to actually do in another league where i paid like 500 bucks up front for it but i'd imagine that was kind of like the energy that a lot of analysts um had coming in and just to kind of bring us all into this right now this is bash talk where every single wednesday i'm bringing in someone that's competing in the big dog bash that is as we put it influential as shit they've got the role in the discord they're known throughout the community uh today we have mr josh larkey over here he is the director of fantasy and gambling at the 33rd team. He's a very smart, intelligent, analytical person. You've probably seen him uh, on Twitter. He used to work over at Player Profiler, did a lot of work with Matt Kelly, which is how I came across his work originally. But he has kind of um, been all around the sports world and been doing a lot since before and after that. Uh, So Josh, you know, welcome to the show. You could tell the people that don't know what you got going on a little bit about yourself as well as the 33rd team, because I actually am a little bit curious. I don't think I've actually heard of them prior to hearing you uh, jumping on board with them. So just give us a you know quick background on on your entire life right now. All right, Nick, thanks for having me on. I feel honored. Week one just happened. You're already having me on. Maybe that just means like you're expecting the engagement to build as the bash goes on. So you just need to get like the really <laughs> shitty guests, all the like boring analytics nerds out of the way first. Exactly. So you asked about 10 questions. I'll try and get to all of them. All of them. So so my background is I'm like a like a true analytics nerd at heart. I have a master's in analytics. Never really wanted to go the corporate path. Worked in baseball for two years. Got fired from both teams. One, because they just didn't have the payroll. The other, because of COVID. So uh, I've always kind of had that chip on my shoulder. We talked before the show about like the how the grind never ends. So I ultimately had been working for Matt Kelly at Player Profiler while I worked in baseball on the weekends just to kind of insulate myself. Like in case something happened, maybe I have a backup plan. So basically lobbied him for hours before the 2020 season started. Uh, he was like, hey, you want to run our DFS products? I hadn't played DFS before, so of course I said, yes, I would love to run the DFS products for the 2020 season. Just did uh, an absolute ridiculous amount of research the month before the season. We ended up making the most money we'd ever made for our subscribers in 2020 that year from DFS perspective. And Matt said, I like your style. It's very data-driven, but it's not boring. Do you want to just start leading all of our data-driven projects? So that's kind of what I did the off-season, the next 2021 season. And then eventually found my way to the 33rd team where 
I'm no longer like the the analytics nerd coding in the basement. So I guess like background on the 33rd team. So it was Mike Tannenbaum and Joe Banner, two former NFL GMs. And they wanted to make kind of like a football think tank. Uh, I believe like the original impetus was Tannenbaum was going to go on ESPN to do 2020 NFL draft talk. And obviously like you want to make a really good impression when you do that. So he found some college interns from, I think it was UMass to help him out and do research. And he crushed the, the ESPN process. And I think a lot of it he felt was due to those interns. So that's that's kind of how the 33rd team became born was like, let's try and get young people more engaged. Let's try and try figure out more opportunities for them in the industry. So it was basically like a research think tank that was football related. Two years go by and they were like, we have a really noble mission to make a lot more money. They got two big investment groups involved and wanted to expand into fantasy betting and DFS for this season. And they wanted someone that was very data driven because they liked the idea of, as Joe Banner always says, like, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Like if you have a high batting average, people will pay attention. So we wanted someone that was very data-driven and that could help create like a really strong team that just got things correct. And through the blackmail interview process, I convinced them that I was the right guy for this position. So I, I've essentially hired and am now leading a team of just over 20 people that do fantasy betting and DFS content. It's all pretty data-driven, but engaging at the same time. And we're slowly finding more and more ways to kind of overlap with the football side since the 33rd team, one of our like competitive advantages on the football side. So like on the, the fantasy side, it's that we, we, we use data a lot. And then on the football side, it's that we have a lot of NFL talent. So we've got a few dozen former players and coaches that do video for us. And we were basically like, hey, instead of going into like an ESPN office or the CBS office, we're going to ship out a camera and a mic to you. Record something in your kitchen. It's going to feel personal. You're going to enjoy doing it and send it back to us. So we have a lot of video content and other interesting angles like that on the football side. So we're slowly now kind of figuring out how we blend in like the, the hardcore film football with more of the analytically driven fantasy betting TFS. And that, that's kind of what we hope our secret sauce is. It's like the, the harmony of those two. Hopefully I answered your questions. I guess the one thing I'll add, all our content this year is free. If you're like, hey, I paid a lot of money for the bash. I don't have a lot of money to spend. Cool. You can check out the 33 teamcom 100% of our content is free this year. That's awesome. I, I think I, I think I hit on everything. I think you answered like three of the 10 questions, but if we made you do <laughs> all 10 of them, we'd be here for the next like six hours. And I know you've got a lot of work on your plate. I did see the tool that you uh, you tweeted out like last week. It's, it's this like huge statistical gathering basically where – very filterable. And it kind of, what it does is, um, and I'll link this below for all the people that are watching afterwards. It's this really, really cool tool that's that was almost non-accessible to people out there that were playing fantasy prior to this tool dropping. It was a lot of like the PFF data, the advanced rushing and receiving uh, analytical data, you know, the, the missed tackle source per attempt and the, all those kind of numbers that like we as content creators might use or we might pay for these like paywall type things to get that information to get them out to people and now you guys have it readily available for everybody else so that was one of the coolest tools that i've been personally using since you dropped that and i will be using throughout the rest of the season that kind of like bridges the gap between again people like myself and people out there who are not as hardcore into it but still want to know the numbers that they should be looking at it helps cut out the noise um so why don't you like talk a little bit about that tool and maybe the thinking or the process behind getting that out there just like from a technical standpoint, but also the way that you guys got it out there for free and just, you know, the idea behind making sure it was accessible to everybody. Yeah. So this was something that had been going on in my head for several years. We called it the edge. That was uh, our head of betting, Chris Farley's idea. I like that name. So the, this tool was something I've been thinking about for years because I've always done really, really hardcore analytical research. I code in a language called R. It's it's very intense. And most people, like if they hear that, they, like their brain just shuts off or they're like, cool, bro. I'm glad you do that. Never fucking going to do that myself. Like, are you kidding me? You think I'm going to code? You. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I felt like what I would do is actually really efficient research and it would really help me in fantasy. So I wanted to figure out how to help someone that has no interest in coding, no interest in analytics, but just wants to be better at fantasy football or better at betting, be able to easily access the stats that matter and that I look at. So we kind of curated all the stats that we think are actually important, predictive, descriptive of what's been going on and making it super easily filterable since this is the type of stuff that I'll basically do in my when I'm coding and I don't have to do a lot of that coding anymore because we just have this tool. So it's going to update each week during the season to bring in all the new routes, snaps, data, targets, data, all the all the advanced stuff. We have some really cool pressure stats some contact stats for running backs. Uh, definitely check it out. So it's the 33rdteamcom team.com slash the dash edge. And I, I guess like one other thing is I, ne 
you're the same way. I never want to do something that's been done before. It's like with the bash. It wouldn't have been as fun if there were like seven models of it in place of like, oh yeah, it's been done this way and this way and this way. We're going to tweak it slightly. It's like, no, this is totally new. And that's what I wanted this tool to be. Because one thing I know is that in this industry, it's saturated. There's so much out there. And what you really have to do to get people interested is you have to give them that holy shit moment. And if they don't have that, they'll be like, oh wow, that, that's cool. And then they just go right back to their day-to-day, -day, whatever they've been doing. And that if you want the bash to work, if it looks like everything else, it's like, oh, like that, that's kind of cool. I mean, people reach out to me all the time. Like, hey, I've got this charity tournament. Do you want to join? And it sounds basically like a weak version of the Scott Fishbowl. And I'm like, no, thank you. Like I'm, I'm the Scott Fishbowl. I'm in a lot of leagues. No, that, that did not give me any type of feeling. But when you reached out, like, I honestly don't own NFTs. This is the first NFT I've owned, but it was an interesting new idea. So immediately I was like, yes, that is something that I want to be a part of. And I feel like that's what I tried to accomplish with the tool is that when you see it, you go, holy shit, this thing is easy to use. It's free. This is now part of my workflow. And that's kind of like what I always want to give is the experience or else people will be like, oh, that's, that's nice. But here's the six other things I already look at. No, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's easily like the cleanest, most easily usable tool that's free and widely available out there. So I honestly couldn't say enough good things about it. It's a, it's a lot of the tools that I use just kind of combined into one and anyone can just hop in and start doing their own research by it. So it's awesome. And I do want to like pivot back to what you're saying about the bash hose, like kind of this new idea that we had been permeating on for a very long time before actually launching this thing. So you said this was your first foray into NFTs. Yeah, this is 100% my, my first time checking it out. It's not that I had no interest. It's purely, I just don't have a lot of time on my hands. Like we, we talked pre-show about how like this industry like makes dating like pretty hilariously bad at times. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like you have friends that aren't in the industry and you just can't hang out with them as often during the NFL season as you'd like. There's just so many things I wish I could do that I just don't have time for. I also need to sleep like eight hours a night, unfortunately. <laughs> so yeah, NFTs was always something I was curious about. I just didn't have, I felt like if I was going to dive into it, I wanted to be an informed person. I didn't want to be one of those people that's like, let's just drop 5K in NFTs and see what happens. I wanted to feel like I knew it. So when you reached out, you're like, hey, I'm going to give you this one for free. You just have to participate in the bash. It seemed like the perfect way to, to jump in and start getting some type of exposure to it since, I mean, what easier way than with fantasy football? I love fantasy football. Uh, it seems like there's going to be some smack talk, stuff like that. I mean, everything that I like about this industry, the bash seemed to embody. So it felt like a, like a slam dog for me to be like, yes, let, let's bash. Yeah. That's, that's like pretty much the idea behind it was that we knew 99% of the people we'd be talking to, reaching out to pitching as customers would have the same mindset as you where they've never owned an NFT. They don't know the process of anything like crypto native or crypto related. So we had to like pave a path that was just as easy as basically participating in any other fantasy football league and we knew that afterwards like after a while people would see that the the nft part of it behind it was actually like the cool added value because as soon as we right the mint day happened everybody like revealed their art or whatever you guys got yours and this is something that i'll have to think about for next year right this is like a one-year process for us and this was basically like a test run for us to see what is the the perfect divide between like influencers like yourself and then the people that are in the BDG audience? And it's like, who's more passionate about it? Who actually helps this project get pushed forward a little bit more? And one of the things like that was cool as shit, like the whole NFT part of it opens up this secondary market, right? Like you, like your, your league nine pick number nine. So everyone can see on their NFT, like where exactly you are in your league. So before the drafts actually happened, I was in league one. So I'm like a rare league, right? So if you're in my league, that becomes a little bit more valuable because there's more prizes, there's more stuff attached to it. And we had um, people flipping their NFTs to get into different leagues and, and get into different draft spots. That's not something that you could do. There we go. <laughs> yeah, this yeah let's, not, let's throw it not. up there. <laughs> um, and that was like the coolest part about it to me was the fact that like you can kind of maneuver how you want to do it, but there's real world you know, impact to it. Like you're going to have to pay to get into it. You're going to have to flip. And there's people doing like off the book deals like, hey, I'll give you my normal league for your rare league plus like 0.2 ETH in order to move things around. And I think that's like the dynamic of it that people who are not NFT native won't understand yet. But once they start seeing it happen, they'll be like, oh, I could start implementing this into like what my brand is and what our content is and different projects that we want to do down the line. So like you said, the idea was very much to have people look at this project and be like, I don't know anything about NFTs. But the way Nick's talking about it is like, I don't, I don't need to. It's ex it's exactly a fantasy football league that I'm looking to play in. 
but NFTs are, are a part of it. I don't need to know anything about it. Right. And that was like the energy that we needed to convey going into it. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy about how it's gone so far. We haven't had any like hiccups, no problems or anything like that. But week one is in the book. So records are flattened. Records are there. They are officially on the blockchain forever. And Josh Larkey, you will forever have started off 0-1 in the big dog bash. So let's talk a little bit about your team. You actually lost to uh, Scott. Scott is a guy who is maybe the first ever like BDGE team member in terms of like doing work for us. He was a video editor for me for a long time, um, probably dating back like five years or so. So he's like an OG BDG team member. He's in there. You're also in a league with uh, my buddy Snacks, who's, who's done a bunch of podcasts with us. In there, I don't think there's any other like actual influencers from the um, from the industry in there. But you got an exciting league from like a brand standpoint. You went against Scott in week one. Let's uh, let's look at your draft for a second and just kind of talk about your your strategy going into the draft, how it played out. We talked about it a little bit earlier on. And then maybe, you know, you can give like a quick synopsis of what you were thinking going into it. And then looking at it now after week one what would you have done a little bit differently in terms of team building? So when, when I look at a league, I always try and tailor my draft strategy to that league format. I know that sounds kind of cliche, but I'll sort of explain what I mean by that for this league specifically. So first off, it's it's a two quarterback league or it's super flex, super, yeah, super, super flex. flex. So basically, I, I always think of those like two QB leagues, yeah. basically the same thing. You ultimately want a quarterback in that super flex spot. I, I kind of went through the thought exercise of do late round quarterbacks hit hard? Like, can I get a QB one late in the draft? And I thought about like the, the late round quarterbacks that you can ultimately get like that become QB ones. It's like a, like a Justin Herbert, or maybe you could have said it was like Lamar Jackson from like three years ago. I didn't feel like there was anybody like that since like the historically, it would have been a Trey Lance type or something where you go, Oh yeah, this guy, he's got monster rushing upside, but uh, he's probably bad at quarterbacks. So he's going to fall to the eighth round. That's not really what happened. Like Trey Lance goes early in these leagues. So ultimately, I realized that did not like any of these rookie quarterbacks. Kenny Pickett did not feel like some future Justin Herbert fantasy asset. So I took two quarterbacks early because I figured there's absolutely no way I'm getting a good quarterback later on in the draft. So I started Lamar and then Jalen Hurts out of the 109 spot. And I kind of felt like that was, here we go. These are two foundational quarterbacks. If they both stay healthy, I have a really strong chance to win this league because I'm getting 25 fantasy points a week from each of those slots. And then from there, I thought, okay, well, what, what else is kind of replaceable? What's not replaceable? Uh, maybe it was a mistake because David and Joku didn't do shit, but I kind of felt like a half PPR format where it's deep because what are we, we've got, we got two flexes and a super flex yeah. and you start three receivers. That's a big starting roster and it's half PPR tight ends. Don't score as many fantasy points as the other positions. It felt like a no brainer just to fade tight end. Since there's no premium, it, it kind of felt like, why would you pay up for the position that scores the least? I'm trying to score a lot of fantasy points. And with these scoring settings, tight ends don't do much. So I kind of knew I was going to fade tight end quarterback early. And then I knew I wanted a ton of receivers because it was three wide receiver. So I ended up with the, the old hero RB build where I had fat uncle Leonard Fournette and a ton of receivers. It looks and then all the like late round running backs. Pick, man. That looks like a great pick right now as your hero. Uh, RB. I, I love Leonard Fournette. He was one of my most drafted players last year, his ADP shot up seven rounds. He continues to be one of my most drafted players. I have this very unnuanced, but also nuanced take on Leonard Fournette. So who's, who's the best talent evaluator in the world for the NFL right now? Tom Brady, right? I think we would agree. Tom Brady knows football better than anyone on this planet. And who does Tom Brady trust for 80% of the running back snaps? Leonard Fournette. He hasn't felt this way about a running back. Since Corey Dillon, I what I don't know. It's, I I'm a stats guy. The stats think Leonard Fournette is fat and slow and inefficient, <laughs> but I can't help but think, well, there's Tom Brady right here. He knows football better than anyone, and he happens to think that Leonard Fournette gives them the best chance to win by being out on the field as much as he physically can. So that's yeah. why I'm just such a huge Leonard Fournette guy. That was yeah. That was something I harped on a lot this summer as well. It was just like I liked Rashad White pre-draft as much as anybody. As soon as he landed in Tampa Bay, I was like, I don't like the landing spot because when you're with Tom Brady, he clearly trusts the shit out of Leonard Fournette. And secondly, like any rookie, the leash that they have behind Brady is so small. Like Rashad White was always uh, he was a raw prospect, right? He had two years at JUCO, he had two years at um, at a real college, but he was also a raw runner. 
who's also a raw pass protector, like very athletic, like a high upside if things start to get pulled together. However, with Brady, like you don't have that time. You're not in the Houston offense. You're not in this offense where it's like everybody's looking to like get better together. It's like you come in ready to fucking play. You don't miss pass blocks. You don't drop passes. You don't miss running holes, uh, running lanes, right? And that's what a raw rookie like Rashad White would end up doing once or twice, and that gets you yanked off the field. So it's like it's almost like Leonard Fournette. You don't even have to believe in him as much as you just have to believe like you said, in the process of trusting Tom Brady. And right now he probably is the best talent evaluator. And Leonard Fournette's just in such a secure spot. The the only concern I have Fournette at this point is like, is the volume going to be too fucking high for him to stay on the field for the 17 games? Like if they're giving him 25 touches a game, eventually he's going to roll his ankle or high ankle sprain or something like that's going to, uh, going to happen to him just out of sheer volume. But until then it's fucking wheels up. Yeah. I thought the same way about Mixon. I was like, damn Mixon, 27 rush attempts, nine targets, but I hope he doesn't get this volume every single week because this is how you break a running back. It's when they get 35 touches in a game. Yeah, it, it's kind of that, that push-pull. That's one thing. I So Fournette's usage wasn't really what I wanted, actually, this, in week one, where it was pretty much all on the ground. That's kind of why I like to target the pass-catching running backs like a Fournette, is if they're going to get 20 touches, but six or seven are through the air, uh, they're less likely to get injured, and they're just more efficient fantasy point touches. The I think he had like a 7%, 8% target share. We'd like that to be closer to 15% over the course of the season, but can't complain too much. I mean, once again, like it's who we thought he was. He is the bell cow in Tampa Bay. Yeah, and then you and then you uh, you stacked a bunch of receivers in a row, which, again, which this was like a very – very heavy strategy for most of the influencers in the leagues. You went Higgins, Mike Williams, Marquise Brown, Jerry Judy, Devonta Smith, DeAndre Hopkins, Karish Tony, all in a row. I think that's seven rounds in a row. I did a bunch of similar builds in most of the leagues that I'm in this year. And unfortunately, I have a lot of Mike Williams. Hollywood Brown, I can't say like he ended up with an okay stat line after week one, but I can't say I'm overly excited relative to how I thought he would be involved in this offense. But then again, Arizona just looked miserable against KC in week one. So I guess like concern levels here. T. Higgins had the concussion. Not concerned about him. What are your concern level uh, concern levels with uh, with Mike Williams right now? So I'm I'm still not worried about Mike Williams. I I'm not worried about Marquise Brown. Not worried about Higgins. There's I'll tell you the guys I'm worried about in a second. Those three I'm really not worried about. Mike Williams, we knew he was going to be volatile. Justin Herbert looked awesome. Yeah, this offense looked awesome. De- DeAndre Carter played. A, like a third of the snaps of Mike Williams and just happened to have a big day. Not, not really concerned about that. This is a starting receiver in one of the best offenses in football who has a high depth of target. The the big weeks are going to come yep. Higgins concussion, not particularly worried about him. And then with Marquise Brown, just this whole Cardinals offense looked like Dick. There was no Rondale Moore. They're going to get Hopkins back in a few weeks. I think they, it's just, it's, it's tough for Kyler. He's playing a, a decent defense in the Chiefs, and he's throwing to thirty-something-year-old Zach Ertz and Hollywood Brown. And then he like his next receiver was Greg Dortch. That was kind of like what the pecking order looked like. So I, I give him a, I'll give him Brown a mulligan. I'm worried about some of these later round guys though. Oh, I guess I have Judy too. Judy seems like a fine pick so far. Well, we'll see. Weird, weird day for Denver, but Devonta Smith concerned about that one. A few targets didn't do anything with him. AJ Brown looks like the alpha. Kadarius Tony literally didn't play. I think he had two rush attempts, was yeah. never actually targeted. That's concerning considering he was one of the 10 most efficient receivers per route last year in terms of getting targeted, plus was number one after the catch per target. That seemed like a great late round pick. Russell Gage, I also took, I mean, God, he barely saw the field, was not in the game plan, even though Godwin got out early. That's concerning. And then Hopkins, we talked earlier, the cocky motherfucker pick where I go, I think I'm good <laughs> enough at this that we're going to take a player in like the eighth or ninth round who's not going to play for six weeks. So <laughs> overall, like if this same thing happens again, I'll start to be concerned. But I generally don't worry too much about like the week one variants. Like if I had Cam Akers or something who I have in like a couple other leagues, I'd be panicking. But I don't have any landmines like that, fortunately, like so far. Okay. Um, week two is your lineup. Have you even looked at your lineup? What's your What's your typical like week like if you're setting fantasy lineups and stuff because i'm in probably i'm not in too many leagues actually i've been able to cut down for the most part i want to say i'm in like maybe a total of seven or eight leagues which is probably way fewer than the typical yeah that's not a lot the typical yeah i've cut out so many over the last few years just because i know i have so much shit to do during the week and then having to set waiver wires and then before you know it it's almost like you get all these leagues in and then you're worse at it because you're in all of these leagues you can't pay attention to anything you can't look at you can't look ahead on the waiver wire so like what's your typical week for you because i'm just like cramming content nonstop monday tuesday and then like if i remember 
Tuesday night at like 11.30 p.m. I'm like, ah, fuck, let me just like throw random mm-hmm. numbers at these random waiver wire things. And then it's like back to content Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Hopefully I've paid attention to all the injury reports and shit like that. So what's going on through your head like throughout the week? So I just counted. I think I'm in 14 leagues. So it's not like I'm in a ton either. It's the same thing. I just don't have time. About half of those are dynasty leagues. So I guess actually we're probably in like a similar amount of like seven, eight redraft leagues. So oh, that was actually I'll... including my dynasty leagues. Oh, really? So- okay. Yeah, 28, 28 uh, player rosters. And then, like, this is even, like, 20 teams with no kickers or defenses. So, for the most part, that's kind of why I like playing in those leagues. Because, again, like, there's not a lot of movement happening on the waiver wire. So, you don't actually have to be that in tune. It's more about the draft. It's more about trading. Um, but those are some of my favorite leagues to play in. Probably because you don't have to do as much work, you know? So, yeah, that's that's what I like as well, is when yeah. it can be something like this, a little bit deeper. I like drafting more than waivers. I think most people are like that. I like the head-to-head matchup, and I like the draft. Waivers. No. So, uh, yeah, 14, 14 leagues. What I'll do generally is I'll evaluate my rosters on Tuesday morning. So I kind of did that this morning and I'll basically just like set a skeleton lineup for each team, just gut feel. And that helps me just kind of immediately know, okay, this team looks really weak at X. And then just throughout the day, it'll be on my mind a little bit as I do waiver research. I'll think about like leagues, 14 different leagues yeah. are just like randomly on your mind all day. Just, just circulating. So I'll just start thinking about like who I might like on the waiver wire. So this league, the the biggest thing is I was like tight end and running back, which kind of makes sense. Like I had David and Joku and Evan Engram. That's an absolutely terrible start sit decision. I don't like either of them. They're both going to give you a few fantasy points a week. Most likely uh, the waiver wire was pretty bare. Like a uh, spoiler alert to my league mates. I'm probably gonna try and pick up Taysom Hill which just doesn't feel great <laughs> considering like he, he, it's not even like he touched the ball very much. He just had that one like really explosive run. Yeah. Tight end, a little concerning running back. I'm still just going to have to monitor it. Like Fournette is just locked and loaded. We're riding or dying with Lenny. And then I had Melvin Gordon who I started this past week. He got me something. The rest of my running back room though is pretty bleak. The only exciting one at this point would be Jalen Warren. If Najee Harris misses, I have him, but probably going to have to do some. And that's usually what you happens when you do hero RB is like you're, you're looking early and often on waivers for running backs. So this league's going to be quite a bit of work, which I, I kind of know. And that's why I don't do too many leagues is like, I know my draft strategy is going to be heavier on receiver. And therefore like Tuesday, Wednesday, like when waivers are running in the various leagues, like I'm going to have to be pretty active. Yeah. That's um, this is like the first year I've really gone super wide receiver heavy in most of my drafts. I'm always someone who if I, if I've had to t- uh, break a tie or if it's like you start to running backs to wide receivers, I typically lean running backs because i feel like if you all else equal if you hit on a running back versus a wide receiver they're probably going to do more for you although there's so many more wide receivers that you feel comfortable with in your starting lineup but i found very very quickly that in most of my leagues my my rb2s are just straight fucking booty man and it's giving me like anxiety thinking about it i'm like yeah there's a lot of work to be done in a lot of my leagues having to scour the waiver wires and i guess you know this week in particular feels a lot like i actually just dropped my waiver wire video for this week and i used one of your tweets in the um in the waiver wire itself i think you were talking about Dontrell hilliard because i'm looking at this week's waiver wire run in particular and by the time this airs it'll already have run so i don't want to like hop harp on this for too long but there's like jeff wilson there's Jalen Warren, there's Dontrell Hilliard, uh, there's a couple other guys like that, but this feels like a, it's going to be an overreaction type of waiver wire week where people get really excited about Jeff Wilson, but he's in a committee with Trey Lance, Debo Samuel, and probably some other running back there in San Francisco. Jalen Warren, all signs sound like Najee's going to play. I don't know how serious that is. That's just like player like J.K. Dobbins type beat, you know, over there. And then it's Dontrell Hilliard, who, again, you said like didn't really – actually play that much. He had one or two explosive plays, but that's not actually predictive of, you know, being something that's going to kind of come off weekly. Now, I guess like looking at the waiver wire, what type of moves are you looking at in a big league like this? Because there's not a lot of pickings. Like I'm assuming, you know, the Josh Palmers were were drafted in leagues like this and you have to go kind of deep. I'm, I'm looking at dudes like Kyle Phillips, who has like a, a shot to be a real player out there in Tennessee. Um, what, what do you got your, your eye on right now? So at tight end, I'll be targeting Taysom Hill. I'll probably put a decent amount of fab on him just okay. because my tight end is so weak. There's really not much else at tight end, honestly. it's Tight end's pretty bleak. It's probably Tys- Taysom Hill or bust. I'm not going to target any receivers just because I have so many good ones. And mm-hmm. I, f- I feel like if I start 
trying to pick up receivers on the waiver wire that I'm kind of betting against like all the pre-draft research that I did for this type of team running back um, looking right now, like Joshua Kelly, I think is interesting just because the, the chargers offense is so good. And while it seems like Sony Michelle is definitely the backup based on touch counts, Kelly actually had more, he ran more routes than Sony Michelle. So I was, I was kind of clinging to that and I was like, Oh, like Eckler <laughs> didn't look great. Kelly ran some routes. Sony looked real so, thick in, in that one. Um, I have him on so many about- teams. I was going to say, so Ooh. Sony Michelle, Sony Michelle is another like unnuanced one, like my Leonard Fournette take. I have Sony Michelle on an absolute truckload of teams, especially in best ball where I do like hundreds of drafts. And it's because the NFL loves him. I don't yeah. understand what it is. He's had 200 or more carries in three of the past four seasons. And the one season that he didn't have 200 or more carries is because he got injured. Like there's when he's healthy, for some reason, teams just have to play Sony Michelle. I don't know so- what it is, but I'm like, I'm no longer betting against him. He looked terrible. Like he still had like way more touches than Joshua Kelly. So I don't know what it is, but he's just one of those, like apparently like football people seem to like him. How do you feel about the, uh, the Niners backfield? Cause I'm, I'm looking at your waiver, right. Uh, waiver wire right now. And obviously Jeff Wilson's taking Elijah Mitchell's going to be out for a little while. And then, you know, TDP is getting thrown around and Jordan Mason's the other dude that's getting a decent amount of hype. And he is available on your waiver wire. They, you know, his name keeps getting thrown around, but like he didn't, touch the ball at all i feel like he hasn't really actually done much it feels a little bit like fool's gold as well do you have any uh strong opinions about this niners backfield yeah i'll put in like a dollar or two on him he's someone where it's like oh if i if i get him cool but no he's not a priority waiver ad i i generally try and think about like how many things need to happen for me to want to start this player and that's why i took jalen warren i think with my final pick in this draft is i thought oh you know what for some reason Najee harris goes down he's probably the guy because they hate McFarland, they hate Snell. That's one event, and it's like, hey, you're starting Jalen Warren. So like, if if Najee Harris is ruled out, Jalen Warren on my team is immediately starting for me. Clear cut. What would need to happen for Jordan Mason to be a confident start on my roster? We need the Elijah Mitchell injury. Okay, we got that. We're probably going to need a TDP injury. We don't have that one yet. We'll probably also need a Jeff Wilson injury. And then, and only then, but I think that I could confidently start Jordan Mason. That is just so many things that need to to go right. And that's why I generally don't invest heavily into those types of waiver guys. Like I so like Dontrell Hilliard, I talked about how like, oh, like his usage sucked. I actually think like he's still like better than someone like Jordan Mason, most likely, just because at least like if something happens to Henry, he's probably fantasy relevant. It's just like one event that needs to happen. But yeah, like Hilliard's usage was bad. He ran seven routes. Yeah, like that's a that's a Henry good way ran to look. Twice at. as many routes as him. Which is yeah, which is actually weird. I do think Hilliard's performance probably, I mean, you know, uh, obviously uh, leads to probably more routes run. They are looking for obviously weapons in that uh, in that mm-hmm. offense. So I could see Hilliard actually being a player. He's also been good at, during his time in the NFL. So I wouldn't be surprised if he does carve out like a legitimate role. It's weird that Henry. Um, ran more routes than he did, but I, I, I like that piece on the waiver wire where it's like think clearly. What would it take for this dude? to get into my flex spot and for Jalen Warren, like it's like, okay, there's one guy who's entering the season with a Liz Frank injury. What would need to happen in order for Jalen Warren to be that guy? It's very, very clearly simply put. And for a dude like Jordan Mason, it's literally the opposite. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely like not trying to go all in on the San Francisco Niners backfield. I was, this was, uh, I mean, it's very similar to what happened last season when Raheem Moser went down and then everyone was like, Oh, what's going to happen here? Elijah Mitchell though, you were so much more confident in him as a talent, right? He was like a really good prospect coming out. He's an explosive player. He was someone that like, you could see why he would jump everybody else. You could see why he'd make an impact immediately when he got on the field. It doesn't like, although Jeff Wilson might be the guy who gets 15 touches in this immediate week, he doesn't seem like a guy who's talented enough to be like, Oh, I can't put these other running backs on the field and see what they have. Cause he can't really hold off three other dudes that are trying to take carries from him either. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it is Mitchell. Like part of why he fell in the draft was the, the two things I was aware of was uh, he had a lot of injury concerns from college, I guess, ding, ding they're They're coming back in the NFL. And then the other one that I, that I, I remember is he was listed in college at two eighteen, And then at the combine, when he ran his four, three, he was two Oh one. And that probably yeah. turned some teams off where they're kind of like, what's going on here. Like who, who even is Elijah Mitchell? But the one thing is like, he was a workhorse in college. He was very effective. He ran the four, three. And that's kind of like all you need to see at this point. There's no Niners running back where I'm like, oh man, this guy is, is so clearly in a vacuum, just this superior talent with crazy upside. So yeah, I think like you look at the player talent, you look at the situation and ultimately like we're, we just, we're, 
we're not trying to get like six things right. I'm trying to get one thing right. And I think that's how you should always look at the waiver wire is like, stop trying to think about like, well, if this and this and this and this happen, then I'm starting him. It's like, I want one maximum two events for this guy to like truly force his way into my starting lineup. Cause the worst thing is the player where it's like, Oh, like he's scoring like eight, nine fantasy points a game. Do I risk it? You don't want to give yourself that anxiety. You don't want to have that type of decision to make. You want the player where you go, Oh shit, there's 15 fantasy points a game. This guy just has to be in my lineup each week. Dude, the Elijah Mitchell fucking plot twist at the combine was one of the crazier things I remember. Cause I, sp- I remember watching his tape and I made a video like two months before the NFL draft being like, yo, the 220 pound workhorse that nobody is fucking talking about. And on that film, I was like, yo, this guy's a beast. Like he's running dudes over. He's probably going to run like four, six, maybe even like a little bit higher than that. I was like, he's big. He produces He's probably not going to have breakaway speed. He comes to the combine. He's like 202 pounds. We're like a four, three. I was like, yo, I don't know if he th- Elijah Mitchell threw up Elijah Mitchell. And that's what we fucking saw on the field here. But that was, um, one of the funnier yeah. storylines I've ever seen at the combine. I'm, I'm glad someone else remembers this. Cause I, I was like, wait, hold up. Like I, I was looking at stuff and I was like, th- and I, I double checked to make sure there wasn't another Mitchell because of how stark it was. Like you said, insane. Yeah. It, yeah. I don't know, dude. I, I don't know what happens in the, in that one month, two month time span to get ready for the combine, but whatever he did worked. Um, and uh, I, hope, I hope he gets back soon, man. I would love to see. I feel like he was off to a hot start in week one. I think he would have really balled out this year if he could stay healthy, but that's going to be an issue for him. It's been an issue for the Niners' uh, entire backfield for fucking forever. So we'll see what happens. Um, we are closing down the 40-minute mark, so I'm going to let you go. We just wanted to come up um, here and uh, chop it up a little bit with people that are participating in the bash. So, one, I want to thank you for coming on and you know just saying what's up. Two, participating in the bash. Three for donating wins to my community. We appreciate you uh, you doing your part. We fun, Josh. <laughs> I think you're going to turn it around. I got no doubt about it. You're one of the sharpest minds in the industry. So, uh, and thank you. Just let the people know again where they could find your work and uh, and what you what you got going on. Yeah. So, Nick, thanks for having me on. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at Jay Tweets. You can find me in the Bash League Nine Pick One Hundred Nine, and you can find all of my work exclusively on the Thirty Third Team dot com. It'll all be free. Uh, you'll get a lot of shows each week and rankings from me. So I'll have my rankings dropping uh, later Tuesday. I'll have my waiver wire show with Ryan Reynolds dropping Tuesday, Thursday. I'm on Sirius XM at 6 PM Eastern Friday. I do a player prop happy hour show early Friday afternoon. Give you 15 free player props. We went, uh, I guess we had 16 last week as a bonus. We went 10 and six. So hopefully we keep that streak rolling. And then uh, Friday late afternoon is my big fantasy start set show. So a lot of things that you can find from me throughout the week, all totally free. That way you can make sure to afford your bash pass. Hell yeah. Well, Josh is clearly putting in the work over there. Um, everything that he mentioned, we will link in the description of the show. Make sure you hit the button that looks like this down below. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if you're new. And we shall see y'all on the channel tomorrow. Bye.